Good morning. Um, you know, I can't believe that Marlene, she's from Boston, that she went through all those remarks and didn't say a word about the World Series. I'm stunned by that. <laughs> she and I have more in common than she knows. You know, um, back in colonial days, the original Tea Party took place in Boston Harbor, an act of civil disobedience and, and so forth. And uh, in my hometown here in coastal North Carolina, the town called Edenton, uh, not long after the original Boston Tea Party, they held a tea party uh, uh, insurrection in Edenton. Uh, the difference between the Boston uh, event and the event here in Edenton was that the Edenton event was led by women. And the women uh, sent a statement to the British media that went something like this. We are not hiding ourselves behind costumes like those men in Boston did at their tea party. <laughs> the British will know who we are. First of all, Marlene, I think that says something about the women getting the job done, uh, but it made me think of you because of the pluck and leadership that you and your team at, at Jobs for the Future provide, and uh, we're very grateful for the chance to partner with you. Also, Ray, uh, your comments were very inspirational. Thanks to you and the entire team, uh, Principal Garland at the Johnston Early College High School. Please give him a, a applause again. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you briefly to talk a bit about the work here in North Carolina and to start with thanking our partners with the North Carolina Community College System, the University of North Carolina System, the independent colleges across North Carolina, uh, and our uh, partners at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Uh, they are the people who collaborate to make this movement possible in North Carolina and we're delighted for all they do. I also want to make a mention that, uh, Joyce, would you please stand up, and Michael Webb with Jobs for the Future, please stand up. They have worked for months and months to make this time productive for us. <laughs> Joyce ran 26 miles last weekend. I'll tell you, I am so in awe. <laughs> she said she thought about the conference the entire time. So through the years, as North Carolina has very collaboratively gone about this business of early college, we have visited with many of you outside of North Carolina and learned from and grown with many of you who are in North Carolina. So as you heard from Marlene, this really is a movement about uh, learning and how we grow and learn together. And um, while you're in North Carolina, those who are visiting, I want to give you a bit of warning that you know, may have heard this place as a state has become partisan over the last few years. In fact, allegiances have been drawn and loyalties have been assigned. And while you're here in the state, if someone says to you, so which college uh, basketball team are you pulling for? Don't answer the question. It's a trick question. <laughs> Your entire relationship with that North Carolinian is going to be determined by which color you swear allegiance to. But while we compete on the basketball court, our universities and colleges and business and industry collaborate deeply in this state. Uh, and that's why there is a place called Research Triangle Park. And nowhere is that collaboration more prominent than in the work of early college high schools. Uh, we are very, very proud that um, in this state, as we have gone through one of the worst economic cycles in a generation, the state is actually committed to growing early college. And that growth has been because of those of you working on the ground in classrooms and in schools who demonstrate great results, and those at the state level who demonstrate a commitment to one another, to working together for the long haul to be certain that these schools continue to thrive going forward. I think a part of that story that's critical that doesn't get told often enough is the role of community colleges in North Carolina. Of the 58 community college campuses in this state, 50 are either currently uh, hosting an early college high school or in the process of designing an early college high school. And that commitment is remarkable, and I'm uh, really especially pleased that we're going to hear later this morning from Scott Rawls, the state president of our community college system. Uh, armed with an investing and innovation grant, we are now in the process of scaling the lessons learned and the great example provided by early college into conventional schools across North Carolina. It's safe to say because of the hard work of teachers and principals that the experience of early college and the visitation and observation of early college and the kinds of examples we heard from Ray just a few moments ago, Raymond and his comments, 
Uh, that is what has fueled the notion that this is not just about establishing a series of isolated schools, but about connecting those schools into a network of meaning and using that meaning to escalate change across every part of our state. One change cascading into many, many other changes that ultimately will affect everyone in our state. Currently, there are 76 early college high schools in the state, six are in planning, um, and the uh, expansion of secondary and post-secondary strategies growing out of that experience is just remarkable, and we'll talk some about that later. I want to just quickly uh, tick off sort of our evolution as an organization as we have learned with many of you and grown with many of you, and I want to make a special mention of Educate Texas, that team, and KnowledgeWorks, EdWorks, that team uh, have been very, very important to our growth, as well as Marlene, the leadership of Jobs for the Future. We began this work in focusing on place-based early colleges. Early colleges located on the campus of a two or four year institution. And during that phase of the work, it was really largely about getting clear about designs, design principles, supports for teachers and administrators to grow around those designs. We had to learn a lot with our colleagues um, on the ground. And it's that uh, learning process that has made this such a rich and transformative experience. Uh, we were under great pressure at that time because our governor then, Governor Mike Easley, uh, went to a podium like this with no notice, with me standing next to him, and announced that we were going to have 75 early college high schools, and I was so stunned I turned white and at that point realized that we needed to have a much closer conversation with the governor about the challenging work that you do. Uh, next, after we began focusing on the place-based early colleges, we began thinking about those communities that are remote and lack ready access to a college or university. And that then led us to the notion of virtual early colleges where a school can be on the side of a mountain or in a cornfield. And to explore the supports that would be required for that school to create a college-going culture, to significantly increase rigor, to create a community of learners around those virtual strategies. And later this year, we'll be producing a paper about the lessons we've learned from those virtual designs. We then transitioned into STEM and work readiness with an emphasis not on STEM disciplines necessarily, but on STEM skills development, recognizing that in an economy being transformed by science and technology every single day, that every young person needs to have those uh, essential skills of problem solving and persistence where they can apply technology and science and mathematics in very new and different ways. And uh, we're very excited about the results coming out of uh, those schools. In that phase of the work, we began to make connections into areas like biotechnology, uh, energy and sustainability, um, advanced manufacturing, global logistics. There's a, a list of uh, sectors that we look to in those schools to advance the relationship with STEM designs. And then in the 4.0 iteration, thinking about districts and regions and how do we build upon the experience of successful early colleges to transform teaching and learning in districts, in feeder patterns within districts, or across economic development regions. And um, it was a very clear lesson to us, and there have been many lessons learned out of that process about the significance of leadership. So we've spent a great deal of time working with organizations like the Center for Creative Leadership and private sector leadership development programs to, to identify ways we can significantly expand the commitment to district leaders and to school leaders who can carry forward and build upon this work. Going forward, uh, our emphasis is on pre-service preparation and relationships with the colleges of education to visit our schools, observe the important work that you're doing, those of you from North Carolina, and to have a sustained conversation around what does rigor look like, what does an aligned instructional program look like, what are the effective uses of technologies that are transformative in nature rather than just additive and supplementary in nature. Many of you are doing very, very extraordinary work about that. So let me sort of conclude with this idea that the early college uh, movement um, in this state, and we believe in our relationship with many of you, is about advancing effective teaching and learning. When you blow away all the smoke and all the mirrors, it's about advancing great teaching and learning. It's about blending secondary and post-secondary institutions, as you've heard from Marlene, and aligning education and workforce development systems, and about overcoming what most of us find to be morally unacceptable, and that is a tradition of tracking and sorting that leaves some children uh, with great need and needing great support that they are not receiving in their lives. Going forward, I think for all of us in every state and every country, 
the nature of education is going to change in extraordinary ways, largely because of the advancement of technology. And today, it's novel to talk about blended and flipped classrooms and on and on. I think that's really on the, only the beginning of a very deep and far-reaching uh, change that's going to happen in education. But at the end of the day, we believe it's always going to come back to great teachers doing the challenging and supportive work that's required for students like Raymond to succeed here. I want to thank you for the commitment you're making to this work. I thank you for the commitment to this conference so we can learn what you're learning and share those things going forward. I think it's safe to say that everybody in this room has either drank the Kool-Aid or if you're Marlene from Boston, you've drank the tea. Um, but either way, we're believers, and we have to support each other in those beliefs going forward. I thank you very much for your commitment. So I get a chance now to introduce uh, someone who's become a great friend and certainly a great leader in uh, North Carolina, and that is Dr. Scott Rawls, the president of the North Carolina Community College System. This is one of the largest uh, early co community college systems in the country. Uh, with 58 campuses serving over 850,000 students. Scott is the seventh president in the system's history, and under his leadership, the system has made a real strong emphasis on great teaching, and as a result, has garnered national attention for uh, supporting student success and student completion uh, toward degrees. Most recently, he's the chair of the National Council of State Directors of Community Colleges, and he was recently tapped by our Governor Pat McCrory to lead the education and workforce development uh, uh, underneath the North Carolina Education Cabinet. I'm very proud that Scott's a member of the North Carolina New Schools uh, Board of Directors, but the most important thing you need to know about Scott is this. He's the father of two sons, and I know the thing that motivates him in this work and that motivated him to be today here today is that he wants for every child what he wants for his own sons. And it's very personal for Scott, so you need to know about that um, when you hear him uh, speak with us today. So I think Scott's going to be coming up. Please welcome Scott. Marlene's going to be joining us back up here. 